Met Tony Overwater. Nog één keer applaus, alstublieft. Zijn jullie klaar of was ik te snel? Was ik te snel? Zijn jullie klaar? Ja, klaar. En nu ik switch uh, to English. Thank you very much. Mohammed, can you stay for a few minutes with me, please? Ja? Yeah? Yeah. You were going to sit here. That's okay. Sorry? Jullie blijven allemaal even zitten. Oké, okay, ja? ja. Oké, okay. welkom, dear everyone. My name is Naida, Naida Aurangzeb, and I will be your host tonight. Um, before I will tell you what we are going to do, first I want to ask Mohammed. Like we are here at the opening of the conference, what's art got to do with it? And Mohammed Shahidi, I would like to ask you what what's Tarp Al Andalus got to do with it? Uh, uh, Can I can I uh, uh, speak in Dutch or? That's okay. Yeah. Then I can translate it into English. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> excuses. What heeft and I will. What heeft Tarp al Andalus te maken met waar we hier voor zijn, namelijk praten over art politics in Israël en Palestina? Uh, heel, heel veel eigenlijk. Uh, Andalusische cultuur, ja, yeah, cultureel erfgoed heeft heel veel betekend in, in Andalusische Moorse periode. En vooral ook natuurlijk met de ja, muziek, dus dat is ook kunst. En uh, de muziek uh, ja, die wij spelen, en, uh, die, die dateert uit uh, de 11e eeuw. Dat is echt bijna middeleeuwse muziek. Uh, wat uh, toen de tijd uh, door de christenen en de joden en de moslims uh, 
is gecomponeerd en bij elkaar is gebracht. Een van de belangrijkste grondleggers daarvan is uh, Zirieb, een muzikant uit het Midden-Oosten die vanuit Baghdad naar Andalus is uh, vertrokken. Uh, met zijn stem en zijn oet, uh, die hier ook wordt gespeeld, heeft hij heel veel betekend. En, en later samen met Ibn Baja, dat is een van de dichters uit die periode, ook uit de 11e eeuw, uh, is dat samengekomen en zijn muziek van het Oosten en het Westen eigenlijk... Uh, daar gestart, uh, dat is de Andalusische muziek eigenlijk, die wij nu ook... Uh... Zou je kunnen zeggen, het is de muziek of, of het geluid van culturele en religieuze tolerantie? Ja, ja. zo nee. kun je het wel stellen. En uh, ja, het heeft te maken met uh, verschillende thema's ook, die daar ook in, weer naar voren ja. komen. Dankjewel. Ja. I will try to translate it very quick. Ja. You could say that Tarb al-Andalus, the sound of this Andalusian music which comes from the 11th century, is the sound of cultural and religious tolerance. It was played by Christians, Muslims and Jews all together. Yes, of course. Yeah. And just for, for a while the music was gone. There were not a, a lot of people that played the music again. So you could say that the music had a revival. The music was for a time was the unbekend geworden, toch? So you could say that the music is weer herontdekt. Yeah. Ja, herontdekt in, 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 in Nederland bijvoorbeeld, want er zijn natuurlijk wel landen geweest waar het altijd is blijven leven. Ja. Hè? En dan ga ik dan terug naar uh, de val van, van Andalusië in 1492. Hebben uh, bijvoorbeeld Joden en moslims de muziek meegenomen naar uh, landen zoals uh, Noord-Marokko, Algerije, Tunesië. En daar is het altijd blijven leven en natuurlijk ook naar het noorden. Uh, van Europa. Ja. En, en daar is pas later uh, weer de ontdekking geweest van. In 1492, ja. Muslims en Jews van Al-Andalus took the music with them back to, for example, North Africa. And now we have a revival of the music in Holland. Thank yes. you, Mohamed Shaidi. Yes, Mohamed yes. Shaidi, your yes. last name means the poet. Do you have. Exactly, you yeah. Had een, weet je, ken je een gedicht? Een gedicht? Een poem. Uh, ja, we hebben genoeg gedichten die, zoals net ook, uh, <laughs> een van de gedichten, so we wat, wat in Arabic. Uh, we horen jullie soms even. Ja, precies. Dank je wel. Goed, welkom again. Um, you are here at the opening of the conference, a conference which will be for three days. What's art got to do with it? And usually when I'm asked as a host, I try to begin with something personal, just to, you know, to say something or to make a joke. And for the first time I couldn't come up with, with anything, because I realized that whatever I wanted to tell would become a lecture. Because I realized that if there is any place in the world which you can't talk about in a few sentences, it must be Israel and Palestine. My mom told me a couple of years ago that I was a kid of 10 years old. I was born in Pakistan and raised up in Holland, in Rotterdam. That when I was 10 years old and I would come home from school and having lunch, that I would tell her stories about the holy city of Jerusalem. And I would call it the country of honey and milk, but I had never been there. And she never told me that I used to talk every day again and again about Jerusalem until I returned from Jerusalem, staying there a half a year and a year in Tel Aviv. Then she told me, I always knew that one day you would go there because you always talked about it. So I went there when I was 20, uh, 30 years old. I went to that with this romantic idea that I was going to this, to this country of honey and milk. I fell in love, which I think we all do when we travel around. But then I realized that nothing I did there, or let's say that everything I did or didn't, people always ask me, What's your religion got to do with it? What's your nationality got to do with it? Uh, what's your family got to do with it? I realized that if I fell in love with a Palestinian, my Israeli friends would ask me, why did you fall in love with a Palestinian? And then I fell in love with an Israeli. And then all my Muslim friends asked, are you still a Muslim? And when I made a documentary about the lost ide Jewish identity of the city of The Hague, people asked me, so you converted to Judaism? I said, no, I did not. But you made a documentary about the lost Jewish identity of the city of The Hague. And then I think I was 35, I became the only citizen in the world, Dutch citizen, which was born in Pakistan, 
and holds a Dutch nationality issued by the embassy, Dutch embassy in Tel Aviv. <laughs> so it's no fun to travel around the world, I can tell you. Just this to say that how complicated it is. I think if you talk about politics, if you talk about art, or if you decide to talk about nothing, it's always a statement. Or maybe it's not. And that is up to you to decide after this evening. We have one lecture. We have a lecture about Zionism and literature by Ronit Matalon. And a reaction on that lecture by Christine Hamrechts. But that is later on. For now, I want to ask Myrte Freese, the program director of the Mali and the initiator of this conference. Myrte, the floor is yours. Well, uh, first of all, let me welcome you all. Also on behalf of Dancing on the Edge and a Different Jewish Voice, which are the partners of What's Art Got to Do With It, this cultural conference. Um, last summer, when the kidnapping and murder of three Israeli teenagers resulted in a violent war in which more than 2,000 Palestinians and 73 Israelis were killed. Thousands were wounded and parts of Gaza were completely destroyed. There, but there was little public outrage in Israel about the disproportionality of the violence. Critical views were expressed by the usual suspects, the human rights organizations, peace activists, and different Israeli artists. However, artists that spoke out against the violence and criticized the Israeli government were often met with public outrage and even sometimes physical assault. The position of the critical Israeli artists seems very complex. On the one hand, they are the most prominent figures that dare to express the rare criticism within Israel towards the government's occupation policy. On the other hand, many of these artists are supported by, the, by government funding, for example, and often this support is framed by the Israeli government as proof of being a democratic and tolerant society. In other words, art that is critical of the Israeli state can at the same time be used to legitimize its policies. During that same summer, Israeli-based Palestinian writer Syed Kashua decided to immigrate, immigrate for good to the U.S completely appalled by the increasing hate between Jews and Arabs and disillusioned that his writing in Hebrew could somehow contribute to a mutual understanding and a shared future. Kashua, like other Israeli-Palestinian artists, had always worked together with his Jewish counterparts. However, for other Palestinian artists, it seems unthinkable to collaborate and in their views, misuse art almost to pretend there is a normal and equal base for collaboration and dialogue. It was also the summer that the performance by Israeli act actress Lia Kunig here in Amsterdam was disrupted by BDS activists shouting, this is not art, this is an occupation. And that Flemish visual artist Michiel Boremans was asked by a group of other Flemish artists not to exhibit in Tel Aviv, a request he refused since he stated that art is like a mirror and therefore I do not believe in a cultural boycott. So as you can see, arts and politics seem to be heavily intertwined within the context of the Israeli-Palestinian political reality. Not only Israeli and Palestinian artists are faced with questions about the responsibility they have and the impact of their work, but also Dutch and Flemish artists and cultural institutions have to make choices in what they believe the role of art and the artist should be in relation to the political re reality of the context they operate in. So therefore, we decided to organize this cultural conference, What's Art Got to Do With It?, in which we brought together uh, 30 Israeli, Palestinian, Dutch, and Flemish artists to discuss these complex questions. Tomorrow, we will have a closed expert meeting, of which we will present the outcomes through debate, dance, and theater on Friday night during the program, The Impact of Art. And tomorrow night, we also have a, we will screen the film, Arts and Violence, and one of the directors, Udi Aloni, will discuss this film with the audience. And Friday afternoon, we will screen the much acclaimed film, Ajami. And afterwards, there will be a Q&A with both directors, Skandar Kopti and Jaron Shani. Before I introduce our keynote speaker for tonight, let me first thank the different funds that and sponsors that made this conference possible. 
Many gratitude to the Dutch Foundation of Literature, the Leonard Wolter Stichting, the Prince Bernard Kultuurfonds North Holland, Dutch Culture, Kunst in Israel, and the, initi the Initiativen. And now, it's with great honor that I will introduce our keynote speaker for tonight, Ronit Matalon. Writer Ronit Matalon was born in Israel and is the daughter of Egyptian Jewish immigrants. She's the author of much acclaimed novels such as The Sound of Our Steps and The One Facing Us. She also worked as a journalist for the Israeli newspaper Haaretz, and her work addresses the deeply rooted political and social conflicts in Israel, but is simultaneously a collection of storage, stories with universal themes such as love, family, and relationships. Ronit will talk tonight in her lecture, Zionism and Literature, about the concept of the inner language and the external language, in which she had to find her voice as a writer and why she perceives it as so difficult to be a fiction writer in contemporary Israel. Ronit Matalon. Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for coming here for this, well, I don't know how to call this theme of the event, what art has to do with it. So here are some reflections on my work, my literary work, and others' work, I suppose, I hope. Um, during my endless childhood, isn't childhood almost always endless, nobody knew exactly what is Zionism. And the issue of Zionism did not appear to make anyone sleepless at least consciously. Other issues bothered the inhabitants of our poor neighborhood, most of them new immigrants of Middle Eastern origins. Zionism did not appear to be one of the topics makes, making them restless. Our place was a place of sands and thorns where huts appeared planted arbitrarily in between the sands and the thorns. Beyond these sands, other spaces existed. There were cities, there were kibbutzim, there were towns and villages, Jerusalem and Tel Aviv existed. But we children and grow, grown-ups alike, although we heard about them, did not fully believe in their existence. Our time, too, appeared to be appropriated from the historical time, at times, the, t the sounds of Zionist and non-Zionist history did reach our ears, but these voices often had the quality of mumbling. Our time in the neighborhood was more the time of myth than the time of history. And when history reached us, it frequently acquired the qualities of myth, of fiction. Here is a story which I heard repeatedly in many versions from my mother, my brother, my sister, my neighbor, my grandmother, and then my brother again. In the early 1950s, during the so-called austerity period, trucks carrying vegetables from a nearby village, Kfar Ganim, used to go to Savion, a rich suburb located very close to our huts. There was a sharp turn in the road between our neighborhood and Savion, and every time a truck reached that turn, a rain of beans, radishes, or pea pods fell at the side of the road. The neighborhood women, including my mother, used to stand next to that turn, awaiting the vegetable trucks, each woman holding her weapon, a rake. They stood with their rakes, at times severe, at times bursting with laughter, ready to attack. When the truck started maneuvering the turn, the women with the rakes rushed to pick as many beans or pea pods as feasible out of the rainfall. This army of women was organized spontaneously through word of mouth. Men had no place there, 
It's not that they were excluded, but as my, mother, my brother would say, who could talk to them at all? Most men pretending to play the pater familia's role were unemployed either by choice or by necessity. They had three piece suits, often two color shoes as well. They had, like my father, a thin dark mustache. They had the gestures of displaced or exiled princes. They often sat at a local coffee shop playing cards till nightfall. They drank heavily, or worse, at times they abandoned their families fully or partially. The cultural and economical migration crisis flattened them like a steamroller, turned them into show-off shadows of what they once were or could be in another time and place. I may be overgeneralizing, but this was the basic picture in my childhood neighborhood. Most Middle Eastern families maintained a facade of patriarchy, but were actually matriarchal. Much was written about this collapse at the core of the Middle Eastern family following its encounter with Zionism. But we may not have understood uh, fully the degree to which the state and its representations replaced that father's missing and broken voice in the Middle Eastern family. For many Israelis of Middle Eastern origins, the state became the voice of the father. Uh, the cliché time stood still, covered my childhood neighborhood as a thick layer of dust. Time did not actually stand still. It just repeated itself again and again. And we, the locals, felt as we, as we lived on the outskirts of a tall building soaring high above our, our heads. Was this building Zionism, the state, the events and deeds that gave significance to Zionism and to the state? I don't know exactly. I frequently find myself contemplating those years through cinematic images, universal images, rather than local Israeli ones, like bicycle thieves by Vittorio De Sica, Italian neorealism, early Visconti films, in the margins in which we lived, in what appeared to be a bubble removed from the big time and the big words. In addition to misery and ethnic discrimination and favoritism, there were also expressions of wild freedom and joyous anarchy. This comic anarchy could materialize only in the margins far away from the direct and scorching projection of what we call Zionism. Here is another story continuing my cinematic neorealistic imagery. Our neighborhood movie theater was called Cinema Rachel, honoring the name of the daughter of our internal head of municipal council, Mr. Dobin. Almost every evening we used to go, whole families, including women and children, to watch the film projected at Cinema Rachel. It appeared to always be roughly the same film, a Western or an Indian movie. We would come with baskets full of supplies, sandwiches, hard-boiled eggs, meatballs in sauce, bean dishes, cakes and cookies, bottles of raspberry drink. Each family and each group had its regular seats in the hall, our neighbor, Mr. Tutti, who weighed around 250 pounds, occupied two seats in row 16. The arms separating them were broken so he could sit comfortably. The movie theater, a yellowish, muddy-looking building with windows covered by iron latticework nets, stood on top of a small hill. Every evening, 
when we were watching the film, local kids with no money for tickets would climb on the outside walls, hang on the nets, and peep in. I remember the faces of those kids, distorted by the nets, making an effort to watch. I remember their red fingers turning blue, holding onto the nets. Frequently, my guests wandered from the screen in front of me to those lattice-work nets on the side windows. Where was the real film? Where did the cinematic illusion begin and where it ended? Was there a clear-cut boundary between the so-called reality and the so-called fantasy? This blaring of boundaries between reality and fantasy became our innermost language. This language turned our dim awareness of marginality and discrimination into something else. Side by side with this in a language which was not exactly Hebrew, surely not standard Hebrew, existed external language, the language of the state, of institutions, perhaps of Zionism. That external language steered beyond a glass wall separating it from our existence. We heard this language on the radio, in the Polish pronunciation of the announcers, in the East European accent of the politicians, in the way teachers and headmasters spoke in school. Our local school was categorized, of course, as a school for the underprivileged. In the singing and ceremonies in kindergarten, when we were praised, if we were praised, it was in that external, remote language. I remember the routine of my kindergarten. It was punctuated by corporal punishments, the peak of which was pulling the disobedient child's ear, frequently I was the child, and dragging the child around the room while his or her ear was being held by the teacher's hard had our hand till it turned red. Twice a year we were visited by the institutions, namely by the kindergarten supervisor and the head of the municipal council. When this happened, I was pulled out of the isolated corner to which I used to be exiled much of the time and asked to give a speech in front of the dignitaries. Both of them were very pleased. This one, they said, when she grows up, will be another Golda Meir, said the supervisor, of course. So, mostly out of our awareness, our existence was split between the truth of our inner language and the mendacity of the institutional language, which we dared not define as mendacious or even think of it as false. This mendacity was very remote from us and from our conceptions, and it also had a vague yearn for quality. The falseness of the external language became a flickering horizon which we dare not think of as potentially our own. Those of us, like my father, a self-proclaimed radical activist, who dared protest the mendacity of that external language and denounce it, were stigmatized as weirdos of unsound mind and, un, and, and experienced as frightening. Why were they frightening? Because the same external language, the language of the Zionist establishment, even though it was experienced as remote and not as part of our life, still functioned as kind of an envelope containing our existence, holding together our contradictions and contrasts and enormous variants. That language created a shaky, transparent line connected our neighbor an Auschwitz survivor 
who went out every morning naked and screamed madly in the street, and the Middle Eastern women who worked as cleaning ladies at the homes of the rich, and in the evening, after working 10 or 12 hours in multiple jobs, rushed to the local coffee shop to drag home their teenage boys so they would not deteriorate to card playing and gambling. Once again, the boys were pulled by their ears. It will be erroneous to assume that the inbuilt alienation between the external institutional language and the inner language of the immigrants, Middle Eastern and others, aroused a drive of protest or rebellion. To the contrary, it mostly aroused guilt about not belonging, not being able to belong to the external language. All this complex relationship between the internal and the external languages raised a fundamental issue. What is the affinity between ideology and lived reality? A simple, maybe simplistic point is that ideological awareness is first and foremost a privilege. A privilege of a certain socio-economic status and a certain ethnic background. And in Israeli society, socio-economic status and ethnic background are interconnected. Zionist ideology reached the ears of most Middle Eastern Jews as expressed by another social class and in different accent. When Middle Eastern immigrants entered the political arena in Israel, they frequently sounded as expressing Zionist ideology in a foreign accent. They were perceived as imitators. They were not the authentic original version. A new alienation emerged in between Middle Eastern Jews an alienation between various versions of self and false self into which generations of Middle Eastern immigrants were cast. Uh, from my first days as a fiction writer in Hebrew, and we cannot deny that by writing in Hebrew, one unavoidably, whether willingly or unwillingly, confirms an essential aspect of Zionist ideology. I felt an urgent need to develop a third ear, attentive on the verge of paranoia to all the subtle nuances of the Hebrew language and culture belonging to the space in between the internal and external languages I described. I was not preoccupied with being Zionist or non-Zionist as much as such terms are by definition part of the external language. I was preoccupied above anything else with finding a way to belong to the corpus of Hebrew literature while at the same time remaining loyal to the tips of my toes to the innermost language, which is not the lyrical language of the soul, as could be uh, claimed inaccurately. The American writer, Grace Paley, formulated the issue in a way that touched me uh, deeply. How can one introduce the language of home into the language of literature? Unlike the context of American literature, the language of Hebrew literature was colored by, a, by the Zionist context, and the founders of Hebrew literature did not originate it from the Middle East, but came from Europe to the Middle East. I know that I just stepped into a very dangerous terrain full of booby traps. Here the political cultural coordinates unavoidably cross the literary ones. 
as a fiction writer, I never developed a clear and well differentiated map of the explosive border area in between the literary and the political. I felt that such a thoroughly delineated map with sharp boundaries may damage my writing, constrict my linguistic soundbox. I have tried in the territory of the literary text to be most attentive to the constant trickling in between levels, even when the price of trickling and fluidity is frequent turns, at times barely digestible, from the internal language uh, to the external one and vice versa. Furthermore, the constant shifts and the constant mixing of the two languages allowed a certain illusion of a literary territory which becomes more democratic, which refuses to recognize the cultural and political boundaries erected by the Zionist context between various languages, different communities, divergent levels of Hebrew. And what may have been most important was the need to be as accurate as possible and as loyal as possible to a new third writing identity which that just not fully reside in internal language or external language, but can shift between them with the hope that this linguistic hybrid will increase the freedom of the figure rather than decreasing it. What I say about the freedom and mobility of language and the liberty of the figures may arouse some unease due to its tone and content. My words could lead one to assume naively that the author enjoys a secret privilege of total control over the fictional world she or he creates. This is not the case. Frequently, when I meet readers, including very skilled interprets, I am amazed to discover how they tend to attribute to the author the ideological positions of the book's protagonist, or the other way around, to attribute to the figure's views expressed by the author in a newspaper article, for example. The work of fiction may be read exclusively as expressing some theoretical or ideological direction, may be automatically attributed to identity politics, which I cannot stand, or to feminism, Zionism, post-Zionism, or anti-Zionism. I must mention, though it should be self-evident, that ideology exists in the world of fiction on various levels. The protagonist may identify with an ideology or may be torn between different ideologies. Uh, interventions by the author may be ideological. Language may express an ideology. The plot and the turn of events may be motivated by ideologies. These different layers need not coincide. In a good work of fiction, uh, they definitely do not coincide. The author's ideology may clash with the protagonist ideology. The protagonist proclaimed ideology may be undermined by the language he or she uses, and so on. In short, it's a headache. I lived through such a continuous headache when I wrote my first novel, The One Facing Us. This novel, which follows the history of a Jewish-Egyptian family spread between Africa, France, the United States, and Israel, explores, among other themes, 
the way the different figures confront the Zionist option. I deliberately use the word confront because I do not mean one, only explicit ideological, ideological positions. This is a much broader phenomena. It may be defined as existential pathos. This novel challenge to the exclusivity of the Zionist position does not derive, how, however, from the existential pathos of any particular protagonist. It derives from the structure of the novel, which insists on not portraying Israel as the only option for Jews. There is no single location where Jews live or ought to live. But I hope this implication did not express an external thesis forced by the author on her figures. My hope was that ideology, conflicted as it may be, will stem out of the existential pathos of the protagonist. I hoped to interfere with ideological action and to create a complex interaction between each protagonist and his or her chosen ideology. The good guys in this book, in these novels, Uncle Moise, for example, who left the kibbutz he helped found after he was exposed to racist attitudes towards Middle Eastern Jews, pay a heavy price for their positions. The father, who sees the injustice of Zionism and struggles for justice and truth, abandons his mentally unstable sister and his mother and hurts them badly. So what is the weight of ideology, Zionist or non-Zionist, in this context? How can one quantify the impact of ideology on this novel? I will be saddened if any of my readers or you or listeners here will experience what I say as avoiding having a position, as hiding in a cowardly fashion behind the aesthetic principle of fiction. My point is altogether different. Ideology in a good novel, and perhaps in life too, is not like a matzo ball which one can throw into the boiling soup or take it out irrespective of the soup, other ingredients. Ideology in a novel is immersed in all the soup's ingredients. Uh, uh, often in a conflictual way, the writer as well as the reader must be aware that a Zionist or non-Zionist ideology cannot be extricated as an entity out of the novel, some obstacle it will stand in its way. Let's examine an example, another example. One of the greatest novels written in Hebrew, uh, Yaakov Shabtai, Past Continuous, that's the name of his novel, describes the fragmentation and corruption of a Zionist generation. It presents a profound critical examination of the Zionist deed and its heavy human price. At the same time, the author and his protagonist lament the deterioration of their beloved city, Tel Aviv, as various new immigrants invaded and spoiled it. But who were those intruders, I asked myself while reading the novel, my brother, my sister, my classmates. Does the novel point to those immigrants standing at the margins of Israeli identity? So I must read this great novel with the serious dissonance it arouses, which is disturbing. How to accept the dissonance? 
avoid denying it on the one hand while not allowing it to destroy to destroy the book on the other i must contain such dissonance both as writer and as a reader realizing that dealing with humanity one cannot maintain the hygiene of a pharmacy or that in this human pharmacy there are bottles of poison in between bottles of curative medications i can notice a contradiction regarding Zionism in my own novel, The One Facing Us, as well. Although it does not sanctify Israel as the one and only place where Jews can live, it does not sanctify, it does sanctify the Hebrew language as the one and only location. Even though other languages, French, Arabic, English, intrude into the novel, they are held together within the envelope of Hebrew, in which I am no outsider, no immigrant. It is my home. I cannot lie about it. I cannot even blink. Uh, when examining how this novel, and possibly my writing in general, faces Zionism, I notice that I stand in an intermediate territory in which the comic element may overpower the tragic. It is a tran transitional space in, in between the mental and biographical world of my childhood and that domain of the inner language in which one shrugged off Zionism as boring and uninteresting and the sophisticated hyper-ideological milieu surrounding my actual life at present. In this milieu, people close to my heart walk around equipped with a thermometer with which they repeatedly measure the temperature of their own and the other's Zionism, post-Zionism, or anti-Zionism. In this milieu, people are ready to uproot the other for anything they see as a deviation or as blasphemy. At times, I experience this obsessive need to measure the temperature of Zionist ideology as a very Zionist activity. Residing in between these two mental areas allows each one of them to make the other more accurate, allows finding an ironic angle on each one, reversing again and again our perspective. I remember such a reversal or an enrichment of perspective during the 1982 Lebanon war. I took part in many demonstrations against that war. My thought was chocked with impotent rage and in this militant mood, I went to visit my mother in my childhood neighborhood. My mother once again held a rake but this was no longer in order to collect vegetables from the trucks she walked in her well-kept garden. I gave an endless speech about the damage caused by Zionism. My mother, who actually joined me in some of the demonstrations against this war, suddenly threw the wreck down, enraged. She said, she screamed, don't you touch Zionism, you hear me? Thanks to Zionism, I am not there in that prison for women that my father and your father prepared for me in Egypt. Only thanks to Zionism, I am not imprisoned, she screamed. I felt silent. I was shaken up. Yes, I thought, this is a perspective too. While I'm writing all uh, of this, I feel as if what I am attempting to say is raped in a melancholy layer of compassion. Maybe it all belonged to another time and space, to another literary and political consciousness. Israel literature, including my own, now faces Zionism differently if it still faces it. Israeli society is going downhill 
as the occupation of the Palestinians breeds more and more racist, racist and anti-democratic trends. My soundbox as an Israeli writer becomes less and less self-evident. Fiction, unlike theoretical writing, almost always involves partnership with a community, community sharing the same language. Writing about people requires empathy towards them. But this feeling of partnership is eroded, is wounded, and it becomes much harder for my voice to break forth. I understand better now what the poet, the Polish poet Czesław Milos described in his book, The Captive Mind. That heavy silence of the intellectuals, not out of cowardice, but because the belief that the readers can listen, want to listen, has been eroded. I am not sure that I could write the one facing us in recent years. That novel was planted at the heart of the debate about the face of Zionism, what it is, what it should be. But at the moment, the feeling is that we Israelis are no longer engaged in a debate. There are quarrels, aggression, curses, but the engine of a real debate sounds silent. And the future tense related to hope appeared less and less in Israel's political and cultural discourse. I wonder what politically meaningful Hebrew fiction can be written now and how. Of course, I don't know. We must take into account invisible undercurrents. In culture, as in history, they may be not audible, but they mature secretly. This thought that I don't know what I don't know, and some things in reality and in language may be surprising and wiser than me, gives me consolation. Thank you very much. You can take the mic. Thank you very much, Ronit. Thank you. <laughs> Ronit, actually, if it's okay with you, I want to start uh, with the end of your lecture. When you say that this debate is no longer there, you are a writer. You are a well-known and respected writer. You are an intellectual. Isn't it also your responsibility to reopen that debate? Well, is it my responsibility? Of course it is, but what's the meaning of this word responsibility now? The responsibility of the artist? Because sometimes I feel or I think that people talk about the responsibility of the artist. They are quite nostalgic they're talking about the 60s at, uh, at the 20th century, Jean-Paul Sartre, Albert Camus, you know, the engaged writer and intellectual. It's not so relevant nowadays, not because of politics, because, you know, the big dictatorship is the uh, consumer society, the mass media, in which a writer in television is an item. I'm an anecdote. Most of us. So you give it's up? It's not. No, I did not give up. But I live in a reality. And this reality is less and less and less ideological. But Once, the, you know, in the history of Hebrew literature, the writer has a certain and very important role. The writer was the prophet 
of the ideology of the Zionist project. The writer nowadays in the Hebrew literary context is no longer a prophet. He cannot be a prophet because nobody wants to Would listen. Would you like to be the new prophet? Huh? Would you like to be the new prophet? No, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not because it's... Um, no, I don't want to be a prophet. Not at all. Uh, I don't believe, uh, first of all, in prophets. And I think there is something very pathetic about pretending... You know, um, Primo Levi, my favorite writer, who wrote a lot about the Holocaust, and the, he wrote about the prophets and that he doesn't like yeah. the prophets. But do you believe but in giving people new language? You were talking about this third identity. So maybe the Israeli society nowadays does need a new language to reopen that debate. So of maybe you it should, does. you I could think, give the new language. I think every engaged uh, literature, political literature, and I, I want to say that when I use the term political, I don't mean I voted this or that. Well, being political is our life. It's much deeper. It's much wider. Being political is everything. It concerns everything. I believe that literature and art can give sensibilities wider, a range of sensibilities to their audience, sometimes it can influence, sometimes very rare, it's very rare. And we have to face our society, this mass media society in which a writer, uh, uh, well, mainly writes in, in, you know, in Facebook or I don't know where. You see... Um, if you look back, Renit, at your career as a writer, which were the moments or were the moments where you did feel that you did influence your readers, you influenced the debate in Israeli society, especially if it is about this internal and external language? Yes, I feel that my writing maybe, maybe influenced on this, you know, very crucial discussion about what is the Israeli identity. And I think maybe I contribute, con contributed something to this debate because, I don't know, my suggestion was that to see differently this Israeli identity and not to deny our, I believe, I, 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 I me now, I speak now about these Oriental Jews, mm -hmm. our Arab aspect in the identity. And I was this wrong. Arab aspect of many Jews mm -hmm. in Israel that Zionism, you know, was pretty blind about it um, because you know, it, 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 it didn't want to see the Arabs nor the Arab, Arabic aspect of the Jews in Israel. It's the same thing. You were, I can say that you are the second generation, right? I am a second yeah. generation, yes. Now we have like a third for sure. We, almost, we have a fourth generation of Arab, Arab Israeli Jews in uh, Israel. Does it count for the young writers, so the, fir the, the third and fourth generation of uh, Israelis who had grandparents, for example, from Egypt or from Iraq or Tunisia or Morocco, do they still have this complex re relationship, like you call it, be between the internal and external language? Or is your whole talk about this complex relationship between internal and external language something that belongs to your generation and does not count anymore for Israeli, Israel, young Israelis nowadays? You know, this complex of identity is not solved in the Israeli society. Uh, sometimes you hear those people on TV, well, what are you talking about? There are mixed marriages, you know, you always have, you, we have mixed marriages. It's not true. Of course, there is a big dilemma, a big conflict at the core of the Israeli identity. And you know what? Because still now, when you ask yourself, what is the common denominator of the Israeli collective life. What? I'd, I'll tell you that the, the, the common denominator is that we exclude the Arabs. We have an enemy. 
That's the common, you see, this is an identity in problems. It's problematic to define yourself mm -hmm. by excluding someone. But who are you? Who are you? What can you say about your identity? And is that a talk, a debate that you can have? Is that something that yes. is... Yes. Till now. <laughs> <laughs> Why till now? I'm frightened. I don't know. The atmosphere in Israel is... Uh, You know, I'll tell you a story. <laughs> a few days ago, I was asked, usually, to sign on a petition. Another petition, maybe more radical petition. And I found myself, for the first time, frightened that if I'll sign, I'm going to lose my job. During the weekend, I had many phone calls from my firm friends, feeling the same thing. I don't know. Did you sign? I won't tell you. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, this fear, it's not a paranoia, something very, very, very bad is happening in the democratic conception, life and atmosphere in Israel. It's, it's, well, it's bad. In Holland, we have this thing that if it's I'm about, worried. You're I'm, worried. Yeah, very worried. Yeah. And what is like we see in Holland is whenever there is fear, fear of saying what you want to say, making the art you want to make. I think that I could say that in general in Holland we have this attitude and this culture of going and telling each other, you shouldn't be afraid, just say and talk and, you know, go out in the streets and write articles and... It's how childish. Is it childish? Yeah, in a way. We are grown-up people, you know. We're But, you know, it's childish because if, if you read about people in this sad history of the 20th century, dissidents in the Soviet Union or in Germany, you see that it's, it's a complexity. It's not sometimes, it's not black or white, yes or no. People are doing their best in a certain point. There is an assumption which is my Israeli belonging. I belong to this place. I belong to it. And I have to deal with my belonging. What shall I do with it? How? It's, it's you know, it's, um, I don't know, I don't have clear-cut answer and solution. Of course, I hope that I'm doing and I'll do the right thing, that I won't be, I don't have to be ashamed of myself. I'm ashamed of my country at this point in her history. I hope, I don't know, I don't know. I doing, I'm doing my best in a certain point. I'm not a hero. I don't know. But is it too romantic to say that sometimes we, as an audience, do need heroes? Yes, we do. Maybe that is the problem that Israel and maybe same counts for Palestine. They don't have heroes. It's not an era for heroes, you know. I all, all already told you that I don't know who is that hero, and we learn a lot about heroes. I don't believe in heroes. I believe in decent people. Decent people. Do you, you believe? Know? Because I believe that moral is a question of being decent, first of all. Being decent. Do you believe in a boycott of art and culture? Well, this term boycott is, uh, is very hard. Why is it hard? 
we're sitting here in Amsterdam where the Jewish community boycotted Spinoza. It's a terrible term, boycotting. But, there is always but. Um, I cannot, I'll tell you this. I, I feel, especially after the last election in Israel and the general atmosphere, I feel that my country and my society can no longer, at this point, heal themselves. They cannot. So they need healers from outside? That's what I'm saying. Okay. I, I, that's what I'm saying. And sometimes I feel that I want to say, please, 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 please save us from ourselves. Please. Thank you. Ladies. Because it's, um, it's not only towards the other, it's, believe me, I'm saying it in a deep pain. It's such a self-destruction. So, it's not a, it's not a conclusion, it's an experience, you see. That's what I feel. Thank you for sharing that experience. Thank you very much. Dear audience, around 10 o'clock, you will have the opportunity to ask questions to Renit, so you have to wait for a bit. Now it's time to hear the reaction of a writer, Christine Hammerrecht, on the lecture of Ronit. Christine Hammerrecht is one of Belgium's most renowned writers. In her work, she does not shy away from personal and controversial sub subjects. In her latest novel, The Woman Who Fed the Dog, she writes from the perspective of the complicit wife of Belgium's most well-known child molester. Christine, the floor is for the coming 20, 15 minutes for you. Good evening. It's, it's a bit difficult to, um, to speak after this very emotional testimony. Yes, but I mean, it's due to the technician. I'm wired, so, okay, it's better now? Yes, okay. Uh, first of all, I wanted to say that I have been receiving quite a few emails urging me to sign a petition to boycott uh, the Israeli academic world. And uh, I have, I've been ignoring the, the emails um, for the same reason as, as Renit mentioned, that I, there is something about that word boycott uh, that, that I don't like and that I certainly don't feel to be constructive. Um, it, it seems to me to be highly judgmental. I think, who, who am I to say, uh, living a fairly comfortable life, who, who am I to say, well, these people need to be boycotted, these academics, I'm also an academic myself, uh, and I as an academic have the right to say that those academics need to be boycotted. Um, I feel also that I think, I also think it's highly uh, counterproductive because by doing so, you, you imprison people. And when you imprison people, isolate people, uh, you will strengthen their convictions. You, you turn them into martyrs. Um, and, and so I, I, th I think along the whole line, it's totally counterproductive. However, the reason that I have been uh, receiving those emails is because I was one of the people who did sign another petition. As writers, you, you get loads of petitions, as you do as well. Uh, yes. <laughs> yes, yes, that seems a good plan. There, there is now a website, actually, so that you... Um, anyway. Uh, but there was this other petition where Michael Boremans, uh, a successful Belgian painter, whom I much admire, had been invited to exhibit his work in, in Tel Aviv. And uh, uh, some people contacted me, some women, somehow it seemed to be that the women had decided that I had to do something about this. 
and this wrote a letter saying, come on, Michael, you, you earn a lot of money with your, you, uh, with your work. You can exhibit all over the world. You, you don't need Tel Aviv, okay? You can go to New York, you can go to Madrid, you can go everywhere. Why take your work to, to Tel Aviv? You see, that was the difference. And that time, after some hesitation, I did sign uh, the letter because there is a big difference. If, if we ask Michael Bormans, again, whose work I admire, not to take his work to Tel Aviv, we are not imprisoning him, okay? I mean, he has a whole world but Israel. Uh, whereas if you boycott the academic world in, in Israel, uh, the effect is completely different and you actually imprison people uh, within Israel. That's sort of explaining um, my um, point of view as to petitions and as to boycotting and so on and so forth. Um, I was asked to, I was sent Ronit's lecture in advance and I was asked to, to react to it. And, and one of the, what really struck me, and that was what my, my story was about, maybe I should just read this out. Although I, I, well, let me do this. Okay, that's what I've been paid for, so I will do it. <laughs> Unless you sign a petition against me. This, this. Anyway. Ronit Matalon, is that how you pronounce your name, Matalon? You shouldn't say that. I hate it when people call me Christian or something, but anyway, no, right, okay, you don't care. <laughs> this lady who <laughs> pictures her childhood as a time when she was blissfully unaware of ideology, unaware and unconcerned, in stark contrast with the hyper-awareness that characterizes her present life. Although this lady doesn't paint a rosy picture of her childhood, there seems to be some nostalgia for those years of innocence when stories and movies could be enjoyed without worrying about their ideological content. It didn't even seem to cross anybody's mind that they could be assessed in that way. I grew up in a very different context, but I can easily relate to that experience. If anybody in those days had suggested analyzing the ideological implications of our lifestyles, we would have considered that person to be very, very, very odd. What ideological lifestyles? We would have retorted. Besides, we had no need for such probing. We knew our values to be the only right ones. End of story. Unlike Ronit, I do not find myself today in a hyper-ideological milieu. I live in Antwerp, by the way. Things have moved on somewhat, but ideological debates tend to be resented for creating unnecessary problems. I can regret this. I can be stunned by the lack of sensitivity for certain issues, the sheer blindness. The best example is maybe the inability of many people to understand that Zwarte Piet, Black Piet, with his blacked face and wig of curly hair stems from a tradition of racist thinking. At the same time, I strongly believe that writing does not benefit from hyper-ideological awareness. And maybe you totally disagree with this, but that is my conviction. Now, Ronit seems to share that view and argues in favor of an in-between position. I would like to suggest a different solution still, which in practice might hardly differ from hers. Of course, I would need a lot more time and space to argue my case, but I am convinced that contemporary fiction suffers from a fear of giving offense. There seems to be a cons consensus that the public does not want to be shaken out of its comfort zone. It would be interesting to explore whether it's your experience of saying we have become an item. Okay. Maybe that boils down to the same experience. News bulletins cause enough discomfort as it is. Some people even argue that a trigger alert should be inserted if and when a book might upset a reader. Warning, 
This talk, this movie, this book may distress cancer survivors, rape survivors, Holocaust survivors, war veterans, you name it. Fiction should preferably be inspirational by presenting the reader with role models. Unfortunately, this is too often a recipe that what I feel, it is too often a recipe for bland or even insipid writing. Also such as John Updike, Ernest Hemingway, Charlotte Bronte were often anything but politically correct. Being politically, politically correct was the least of their concerns. The notion was even unheard of. Readers were dragged out of their comfort zone, but their work had power and guts. I'm tempted to say their work had balls, but that might sound offensive. <laughs> I'm not making a plea for racist and sexist novels or movies, far from it. What I'm saying is, let's not be constrained by a fear of offending. Let's not censor ourselves. Writers, I think, should not concern themselves with ideology. Writers should write powerful stories. They should write what they feel has to be written. Now this position may sound incredibly naive and even untenable. Given that ideology, as you say, is indeed immersed in every single ingredient of a novel. I am all too aware of that. But the awareness of ideology need not be immersed in it. Let me give you two random examples to illustrate that important nuance. Hey, you know, I teach literature and I'm totally convinced that this political correctness thing is disastrous for contemporary fiction. Um, I'm totally convinced that, go back 20, 30 years, fiction in English used to be a lot more powerful because writers were unconstrained by that fear of giving offense. I'll give you two examples, randomly chosen. One is Longbourn, a novel by Joe Baker which is an attempt at writing the stories that are absent from Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice, namely the lives of the servants. What happens to the servants while the Bennet daughters, I'm convinced that you all know Lizzie and so on, Bennet, right? The Bennet daughters are fully engaged in finding themselves husbands. Well, the question is, what about the servants, right? Isn't it high time that they were given a voice and a history? The idea is nice and promising, but its execution in the novel suffers from a desire to depict these servants as strong, virtuous, and noble individuals. You would like the servants to display some weaknesses, to have the occasional streak of nastiness, to be, in short, mixed characters. But they aren't because they have to be inspirational. In Geoffrey Eugenides' The Marriage Plot, has anybody read that, The Marriage Plot? The characters, I'm like a teacher, has anybody read The Marriage Plot, right? <laughs> 30 years of teaching does that to you. The characters constantly reflect on their motives and behavior, measuring, as you put it, the temperature of their ideology. As if the author is telling the reader, I have read all the relevant critiques. I am aware of the racist and sexist pitfalls that I or my characters may stumble into. The novel does become a treatise, maybe an interesting one, but a treatise all the same. That, ladies and gentlemen, is not what a novel ought to be. So what should novelists do? For a start, and I'm just telling what is my conviction and it does not need to be yours, for a start they should have a keen eye and ear for what happens in the world. They should lap up as much information as possible also about ideology. They should be as 
aware as possible. Next, and this is of crucial importance, they should relegate this knowledge to the back burner. Turn it down to a simmering degree of awareness and move forward unhampered and unshackled, guided by only one ambition to make a powerful text. If at the end you as a writer find that you don't quite subscribe at all to all its ideo ideological implications, so be it. Maybe all the better for it. It means the text is more than an articulation of your views. It's more than a treatise about your views. Allow yourself to be surprised by what you have written. Don't try to control it all, least of all its ideology. And most of all, don't be worried, don't be scared to give offense. Maybe the proof that you have written a powerful book is when you have managed to at least give offense to half of its readers, a quarter of its readers, whatever. That was my reaction. Thank you, Christine. I will not call you Christian. Christian. <laughs> Christine, I'm a bit... Um, I listened to you and I read what you wrote before and I feel a bit... Um, I had this feeling that in the Western world we were writing powerful text and that we don't care about if we do or do not offend someone. So when you're standing here and keep talking about our fear of offending others, then I feel like wasn't the whole thing in Paris and everything we do and we write and don't, we have this whole thing of believing that if there is something we are, then it is, we are not fair of offending others. And are you standing here and telling us that we're full of fear of offending? Well, it's just, <sighs> Pardon? No, it's, it's, it's just what I find. Uh, I find it hard to speak when I sit. Is that, uh, you can what does that say about me? That, I, that you're that a I'm teacher. very small, probably. Anyway. You want to uh, stand? No, it's okay. It's just that you have more energy when you stand. It's okay. okay let's so stand fine. together. Okay. You um, want to stand or sit? You can sit. You can't came from <laughs> far away. <laughs> no, what I want to say is that it, it is true that if you take a John Updike novel, Right. Or you take Hemingway. They can be like Hemingway is, is totally anti-Semitic often, right? Updike is totally sexist. Yeah. But what you don't get is a constant self-censorship. So I feel that if I am the intelligent reader, which I hope I am, right, that I can see or write Updike. You have been writing a powerful text, but this and that and that is sexist, this and that and that is racist, whatever, right? What I find in a lot of contemporary fiction is that often male writers, they are aware, they have been reading about sexism, they have been reading about racism, right? That they have a fear of being the white male superior colonizer, post-colonizer, whatever, right? There is that awareness. And so you find that there is almost a censorship. And you find that they want to demonstrate, I am aware, I am a reconstituted male. I am not a racist. I'm not a sexist. Yeah. And so you get the sex scenes where invariably it's the woman taking the initiative. Because the male writer is aware of the fact I'm not to be a macho, right? I have read all the feminist treaties, right? So you suddenly have this appearance of these extremely sexual women constantly taking the initiative. Okay, you can say, fine, fair enough, but what you see is the agenda. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? You see, okay, I have a feminist agenda. I have a... Blow up agenda. 
And, and I don't it's... like to, to read the agenda. I want to read a powerful novel. But Am why I making could it... sense? You do. Well, it's about ideology. Mirta, you want to, yeah. Well, obviously so, I'm not. I have spent 10 days on the West Bank and that's it. So how would I, how would I dare to say, here I am in touch with the people in Palestine? I mean, how would I say I'm in touch with the people in the Palestine? And we're talking about art and ideology. Art and ideology. And so we're and talking about how, what I'm trying to do is how, as a writer, you deal with ideology. Tonight? Oh, well, sorry, then I'll shut up and then I won't say anything anymore. No, no, you can still say. <laughs> we're going back to Ronit because Ronit is here and invited here to talk about um, art in Israel. And Friday we will have, because it's a conference of three days, and Friday we will talk about Palestine and Israel both. Tonight with Renit we, were t we are talking about how also the occupation of Palestine influences the way she does or does not write. So tonight, as you can see, there are no Palestinian writers or other artists. They will be here on Friday. Ronit, back to you. Do you agree with that we have as writers that there is this fear of offending? Do you agree with Christine? I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I usually, I don't relate to writers as we. We are not a group. First of all, we are very different from each other. Of course, there are tendencies in literature, but these are the courses in the university that I hated the most, the map of literature and the tendencies. Because everyone who writes, you know that literature, you know, it's not in groups, really. I don't know, I, I don't know, maybe, of course, this, what you mentioned, of course, it's very serious. This politically, this, um, you see, we live in all kinds of mental terrorism. Uh, politically correct is one of them. Are Sometimes, you politically correct? Huh? Would you consider yourself a politically correct writer? No, I'm a Mediterranean. It's <laughs> <laughs> I cannot be politically correct. You know, it's good in California. It's, you know, it's not, it's not about real human beings. Are you a writer but with an agenda? Just a moment. I have certain agendas, not one agenda. And usually I discover my agenda only when I finish writing the novel because I don't know why my agenda before writing. But I just want something that I thought of, that Ernst Hemingway indeed was sometimes a racist, and Virginia Woolf, my beloved, was really an anti-Semitist. And Hemingway is great, and Virginia Woolf is great, although their greatness is not in this pick that, of racism. It's a shame. It's not the great, uh, uh, uh. well, I, I, I don't feel that it's the great achievement of the writing. It's in there and we have to, like I said about Yaakov Shabtai, we have to contain it in the greatness of the writer. The racism, the anti-Semitism, etc. It's complicated, you're right. What did you want to ask me? <laughs> Christine Hammerrecht also said writers should not be concerned by ideology. But we live. Uh, I don't know if they, of course not. Writers should be concerned about words. As Tolstoy said, 
writers write with words, not with ideas. Mm -hmm. True. But the ideas are in the words. So could you say that, could you say there is a difference between a difference to be free from ideology versus not to be bothered by ideology? So maybe it is we shouldn't, of course we have ideology, but we shouldn't <coughs> bother by ideology. I don't know. I don't feel that I'm bothered by ideology. I live in an ideology. First of all, I live in a society, language, culture, which is ideological. On the other hand, I cannot close my eyes to the fact that uh, if you look at Israeli novels written in the recent 20 years, no novel dealt with occupation. I ask myself why. Why? No novel. No, 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 no. I'm shocked. Yes. Why didn't you write that novel? I wrote. You did? People hated me. So there is one novel. Yes. And people hated you. Yes, of course. But it's, uh, yeah, I sometimes find myself talking with friends about, because it's a whole. Uh, not many novels, not at all, as a matter of fact, dealt with the Israeli occupation. It's not only... They you don't see, care I'm not, or I'm not afraid? That, I'm not simplifying the reasons. I'm not saying it's because they don't want to look at... No. I think sometimes those, those writers, amongst those writers who did not write about the occupation, you can find writers, artists who signed on petitions, uh, protest, <laughs> No, it's um, uh, no, it's something else. It's not only political blindness. That's what I'm trying to say. So, what is it if it's not only political blindness? I'm still shocked. Somehow, I really no. It's not only that political blindness. That would be Israeli uh, novels writing about the occupation. Well, look at most of the Israeli novels. They don't deal with occupation. It's really amazing. I don't know why. But if but you say, I don't know why, but that's... I don't, yes, I'll say I don't yeah. know why, because I don't want to be, you know, a Soviet Union about what you, literature should write. If I'll, if I'll, if I'll tell what should, literature should write or should, it's, it's the Soviet Union. Christine, We'll end Soviet with the Union? Soviet Union. But <laughs> at the same time, I'm amazed by this fact about my culture, my society, my, I'm amazed. Christine? It, 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 could, it can be in part a kind of blindness, but it can also be that there is as yet no language for it. No language for it. Yeah. It's, right. I mean, because if you yeah. think, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, yeah. like now, now there are many, many, many stories about the Holocaust, uh, and it's as if only now mm -hmm. that there is a language for it, so maybe you need that kind of distance. Um, I found it hard to believe, but of course I'm not an Israeli and I don't live there, but I found it hard to believe to say there is no language for it. I can, how can there be no language for it? For example, if you, if, if you write a novel about your childhood or about, about no matter what, how can you be an Israeli and not, I mean, I guess in the novels there is a war, they go to the army, Almost all the Israelis that, that I know, the young Israelis, have, in one part of their life, have been uh, as soldiers working in the West Bank before even in Gaza. So how could that not come back into the novels? How can you not have a language for that? But maybe you know that it would be a, an upsetting topic, a highly controversial topic. Uh, what, what position to occupy? I mean, when you, when you write a novel, it's a lot about presentation. How do you present? Let's say you, you, you have such a character, such a character. So is it going to be the good guy, the nasty guy? You see, there's so many choices that you have to make. 
But and that's what I mean by not, they're not yet being a language, not, not a set of characters that you can But you did have a language, Ronit, yes, because you did write about yeah, it. Just, I just want to, I don't want to talk about they. I, I don't know. I, I, I'd rather talk about myself as a writer. If I'm hesitating about a political novel or political theme, my greatest fear is to write a manifest. For this, I'll write an article in the newspaper. No need for <coughs> fiction. Because in fiction, you have other rules. And I wouldn't like to find myself writing, you know, an article. Fiction is not article. That's what I say. Fiction to express not my opinion, I can write weekly in her eyes. But writing a novel is not merely expressing ideas, opinions, protest. It's something else. It's peace of life. And, and I, I wouldn't like to find myself because I'm an, a, just because I'm a political person, writing something redundant, you know, uh, uh, black and white, etc., you know that the French would love. <laughs> so, Runit, you said you ended your lecture with asking what can or should, uh, like, what, where was it, like, I wonder what politically meaningful in Hebrew fiction can be written now and how. So maybe this is one of the things. This is one, this is one of the things, yes. I, I, yeah. But with everything, when we, like, in everything, in every new thing, someone has to be brave enough to come up with a language for us, to, to, you know, to give us some keys so that we know how or where to. So I know you don't want to talk about, about writers as a group, but at the same time, shouldn't be there people out there that say, you know what, we are going to freewheel, we are going to try to start with that, developing that new language because we need that new language. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe. Uh, but I feel um, that I want to uh, remind myself and you something that Albel Kami said and I, I sign on it. He said this involved writer that he does not believe in involved literature, in engaged literature, but in engaged writers. And this is, um, well, this is very important to understand that engaged literature does not mean engaged writers. I do believe in engaged writers. That's what I'm doing now, mm -hmm. by the way. Engaged literature, it's something else. And we have to be afraid of engaged literature. That's what I think. Christine? We have to be afraid of engaged literature. Engaged in the sense of, you know, Soviet Union, the true, we know the truth, the writer knows the truth, now we'll preach the truth, etc. This, this is not literature. A lot of no, no, I only related to this uh, metaphor of the Soviet Union of an engaged literature, that's all. I did not relate to the historical situation, no. Christine? Well, uh, to a certain extent I agree that I, it's the same what I was saying, that a, a, a novel should not in the first place be about some kind of agenda, be it political agenda, ideological agenda, whatever, because then you, you create a character to stand for a certain idea, to be inspirational, and so on and so forth. I, I, I think that fiction is, 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 wants to lay bare complexity. Uh, fiction wants to demonstrate how hard it is to judge, that it is, as you said, it's not a matter of black or white, you see. And then 
Ones like this novel that I was mentioning where the, the servants in Pride and Prejudice suddenly get a voice and a history, you, you see the whole time that there is a kind of ideology. The, the, this person, the, the writer wants to demonstrate that all human beings are equal and these servants who, who didn't have the benefit of an education, somehow they are also noble, proud individuals. So when I read the novel, I, I see the agenda. I, I should, in a good novel, you, are, you see the characters and the events and you are swept along by that and um, it's never easy that we, we took we were talking earlier on about John could say well he's a very good example of somebody who writes difficult novels because he presents situations and there isn't an easy answer to it mm -hmm. so you have to struggle and grapple with the novel you can become very bad-tempered and angry with it you see but it's a good solid interesting novel yeah and it in 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 that way, I agree um, with Ronit, and I, I totally understand this, this, the, the absence of, of, of novels. I, I can see that kind of blindness, which it, also in my society, which is very different, there is that blindness. I think. Yeah, which blindness <coughs> does does in this? Maybe, case maybe you need the Belgian society. Oh, has, we're not going example. to go into that, but maybe you need distance. You, you can sort of think you need a sort of the comfort, the safety of, of distance in order to write about deeply traumatic periods in history. And, and you can't do it. Na de muziek. Na, after the. Wil je het nu noemen? Oké, dan noemen we dat. Ja. Weet je wat ze u krijgt? Ja. Yeah. Met, uh, Weet je, je moet niet zo als boos je... worden. Dat is eigenlijk helemaal niet nodig om zo boos te zijn. English, I'm just saying um... that you shouldn't get so angry. I'm surprised by people getting so angry. Well, what we are doing is we're looking at... And you have... No, but what I'm was... trying to say is we are looking at a very difficult subject. And we are trying to come to terms to it. With, we're exploring possible answers and there's no need for getting so angry about it. The mic is coming... Can you get the microphone even out of my face, Charles? Maybe the lady in the beautiful red shirt. Would you like to tell what makes you so angry? You said we are angry, you are angry, but what makes you so emotional? This is a totally empty evening, and I agree with the man who walked out of the door. That's why I'm angry. Okay. What do you think about a book like Kirbet Kize from, uh, now I forgot his name, you know his name probably better than I do. He was a parliamentarian in the, in the Knesset for 20 years, but it was written more than 20 years ago, I think. Kirbet Kizer. What do you think of that novel? You don't know? I'll be invitation. Do you want to read? That's a good way of writing a novel about uh, a problematic things such as what happened in 48. For people that have no clue which novel you're talking, is it a novel? Yes. And can you say in a few words what, what is it about so that we understand? Yeah, and it, yeah, it deals with... Um, no, you want it? 48 then. Okay. Yeah. But I mean, when was it published? Because 20 years ago. No, more than that. When was it published? Maybe in the... Shortly after, maybe in 49 already, okay. and he's been, uh, and there's been a film made, and it's been on the Israeli television somewhere but in 72, you, 78. For so people, it was controversial first for whether to get it on the television, but eventually the Israeli television showed it. It was on the curriculum in high school. Yes, too. It was? Can you say in two lines, please? Can you even two regels uitleggen waar gaat het over? It's what about, is the book about? A, an Israeli soldier who is with his uh, small group of uh, soldiers, uh, and he has to empty a small, uh, almost deserted Palestinian village in which still two or three people are living, and he describes that. And it's uh, well, he's not very proud of himself, okay. to say uh, the least. And, and it is a novel. A, yes, short a short story. story. A short story. And it does deal with the occupation. That is what it you want to say. It deals with no, no. Uh, uh, 48, with, with the 48. war in, uh, in 48 and with the... 
Okay. And I think he was he did have a language and he was able to write about he it. He did just have like Ma, um, thank uh, you. Daos Decker wrote Max yeah. Havelar. Okay, thank you. So this book, which deals with 48, this writer did have a language, Ronit. Or First was that a different all, language? I really don't like this tone of putting writers to trial that I hear here. I don't like it at all. Am I putting him to trial? Yes. You are, yes. Why him and not this? First of all, let us... I'm making a compliment. For his how, okay. I agree with you totally. Thank you. We're talking about one of the most... We need back yes. to the language. Let's put it, bring it broader. So, was there, could you say that there is a language or there was a language for writing in Hebrew about 48? Let us just, uh, it's a confusion here. Samech Izhar, who is a very, very, very important writer, wrote a short story, not a novel, in the middle of the um, war, 48 war, you know, the Nakba. Uh, this text that he wrote is one of the most, I don't know, well, it's geniusy and it's very, very brave. And the thing that uh, he wrote this text, this, this story, this short story, short, long story, in the midst of the war, he was there. There is a date there. That's what I told you before. This story lies in the territory between journalism and fiction. Journalism and fiction. Okay. It's amazing. It's really fascinating. And of course, there are many, there aren't many like Samech Izhar. And it's amazing how the Israeli society of that time could accept and hear this text and the Israeli society now cannot. Yeah, that's what and would I've be, been yeah. talking about the democracy. Yes, yes. That's what I've been talking about. If you wait for where the she, where, she, where she doesn't dare to write anymore, that's, we should invite her to be a resident writer in Amsterdam to write the book that she wants to write. And that's why I think... It's not what, what I said. <laughs> what I interpreted. You, you, yeah. you don't feel safe giving your opinions anymore. No, no, no. Re writing novels is something else. Let's, let's not exaggerate. I don't feel to express, you know, petitions and so on. That's right. We, excuse me. There are more people that are waiting longer. So if you wait, I do see you. Can, the li yeah, can you go up there first, please? She was waiting for a long time. Hi. My name is Nadia. I'm Palestinian, actually. And I'm supposed to be tomorrow in the expert panel, but I'm not sure about that. At this moment, I feel like boycotting this event, to use the word boycott, because I don't feel represented. Because? I don't feel represented. If this is the opening of the conference, then there's no place for me tomorrow. I'm not represented. If it's really about Palestine and Israel, then there owes to be a Palestinian down there. This is to say the least. This is for me a post-colonial European white approach to the topic Palestine, Israel from an academic level. It's not, we're humans living down there. It's not academic. If we're here to talk about art and culture, then let's do that. Let's talk about what's really happening on the ground, but not about academia, I'm sorry. And I'm an academic myself as well. I'm angry, I feel very frustrated. Um, it's not personal, it's not against Ronit. I loved what she said. If it was a literary evening, I have lovely questions for her. I'm not angry about Christine, it's not personal. It's about how this is organized. Well, nonetheless, I would like to go back. Me. Nonetheless, <sighs> I would like to go back to what anger? you said, Christine. Pardon? I have a question for you that I would like you, if possible, yeah, to answer would, with a I yes or like no. I would like you not to be so angry. I don't believe in anger. I just don't believe in anger. Did you boycott I mean, South Africa or not? Pardon? Did you boycott South Africa or not? Yes or no? 
My, the country that I lived in, the government of the country that I lived in, had decided that it, there needed to be an economic boycott. Therefore, we couldn't buy the cape fruit. Did you boycott it or not? Sweetheart, Did you I, feel there's a problem with the word look, boycott back look, then? Look, look, what you are doing is wrong. Don't lecture me on right or wrong. I have something to you, say. You hurl your anger at me. You are holding now me responsible for apartheid, for it's heaven's sake. It's not personal. You know what? Is you have, personal? as a human, a moral obligation towards human rights, towards international law and moral codex. Either you believe in that or you don't. Let's not start with semantics of the word boycott or not. You say imprisoning Israelis is not okay. What about Palestinians? Is it okay to imprison Palestinians? One more thing. Um, if Nadia. you say not boycott, I have a question for you. For me? If it's not boycott, what are you suggesting? Since boycott is the, the only ah, the peaceful tool left, are you suggesting war to end the occupation there? What is your suggestion? Give me Nadia. a suggestion. Nadia, your point is made, and I would like to it's turn not, it. I have one more. I have one Nadia. more point, and then a question for Roni. To Nadia, be honest. please. No. Nadia, the, the, I'm sorry. I'm no, no, sorry. I hear you, and I hear your emotion. Night. I Take hear your away. emotion, and I will ask Mirta from the Bali. Nadia, I'm talking to Nadia. Nadia, I will ask Mirton. Nadia. Thank you. They're asking me to keep the microphone. I will. The audience decided. Um, Nadia, it would be... Kind of I, I'm, I'm Nadia. still waiting for her. I would like to know her solution. She said no to boycott. Is it war or do you have another solution? Give me the solution. What is the solution? Before because I go to waiting, her, Nadia. Waiting is Nadia, being complicit. Complicit is Nadia, being Nadia, I'm asking you well, as Nadia, a Palestinian. If you, if you want to know my opinion, I Nadia. don't. I think that the one solution, but I may be very naive, is when people listen to one another and when, we, when people speak calmly to one another. But okay. I mean... But I mean, I've been on the West Bank. I, I mean, I'm totally aware of the situation. I'm not saying that this should, I think she shouldn't be. So like, my heart would, is going like this. Bonka, 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 bonka. Would I mean, for heaven's sake, what is this? Would a boycott be Would a boycott be all this aggression? No, I want would to know why all this aggression. Let's pass the aggression. Would, Maria, would a boycott help? Palestinians is that would it help or is it if I would say I am for a boycott maybe you as a Palestinian think yeah but what it doesn't help me in any way does it or does it not Do you let's, believe in a boycott you as a Palestinian let's look is at that what you need it doesn't, it doesn't matter what I believe or don't believe facts on the ground matter if we for look me, it at does breaking, matter. let's look at when did the Israeli economy move at the World Economic Forum last year and a half almost two years ago the Israeli economy moved, the big CEOs moved and forced the Israeli government to, to start, restart the peace movement, the so-called breaking the impasse initiative of the World Economic Forum, because they were starting to feel the economic pressure. Are these facts on the ground towards yeah. a peaceful resolution? Do we want peace? Or do we want to That's talk the same semantics? count for art and culture. I totally agree, and it's a good point about economics. That's the same count for art, culture, literature? Would it help if writers from the Western world would not go, if artists would not go to Israel? Would it help Palestinians? Would it help to make an end of the occupation? I think, and I'm sorry to use that word, I'm really sorry, it's not personal towards you, but it is ignorance to try to frame it in this way. It is ignorance because this is the Israeli agenda saying, oh, you are alienating the artists. It's not true. If you look you at the UK? core of the boycott, divestment and sanctions movement, it says we should work with Israelis. Israelis and Palestinians should work together. However, it provides a framework that works towards peace and away from normalization, away from painting this beautiful picture of, look, we have a picture of a Palestinian and Israeli there living together peacefully. We don't need to work for peace. We don't need to boycott Israel. It's okay to buy stolen products from the, from the Dead Sea because there is peace. This is the difference. The boycott, divestments and sanctions says three things. 
Any Israeli who wants to work with the boycott, divestment, and sanctions, who wants to work with Palestinians, needs to believe there has to be an end of the occupation, that Palestinian citizens of Israel need to be entitled to equal rights within Israel and not, be not have racist laws mm -hmm. against them. And third of all, that it's, it's formulated also in a bit of a very politically correct way, the return of the refugees, but that Israel should right work to towards some, resolu some okay. resolution. Thank you, Are these really undoable? Are these alienating Israeli artists? I am working with Israeli artists who actually believe in this. So they're not being alienated. Thank you. I'm now going to Mirta mm -hmm. to ask her, Mirta, why is there not a Palestinian writer here? Well, sometimes ideology and organization of event or, or the idea you have for an event and the organization of an event don't go really hand in hand. Like, but I don't want to tell you everything about the organization, but I want to try to tell something else. This is a free day conference and normally we have festivals here not with closed expert meetings or closed meetings and the idea now was tonight kind of to give a prelude in which the individual uh, ideas and responsibility of an artist would be presented and we chose different um, uh, uh, cultural expressions and we chose literature to be the opening program and tonight we wanted to have it close to a personal experience and um, I, I'm, I don't think it's chic to go who we wanted to invite and who, who we didn't, but I, will tell, I can tell you afterwards, not in front of an audience. The idea to do an expert meeting tomorrow to bring together 30 artists, Israeli, Palestinians, Dutch and Flemish, is to talk a whole day because it's so complex, even for a whole day, but definitely for 10 minutes of a panel discussion, to really talk it through and, and see if we together could make some arguments that we really would like to discuss with the audience on the Friday night. That's how we organize this. So this is not the program in which everything should be discussed and which every idea and we, tonight the individual experience or the individual ideas responsibility were central. And then on Friday night, we wanted to talk about the artists within the system, the economic system, but also about the boycott story. But we didn't want to have three days about boycott or not boycott because we thought that was not, in, not, not only interesting enough, but it would be too limited. And I don't know if someone else from a part organization wants to attribute this, but this is what I can say about the choices we made. I know. This is part of the event, but in my opinion, it also has to be representative of these values because we are taking a huge risk, a huge leap of being there. I, re I really, I know that, and I, I, I appreciate it. But that's also a reason why there are so little Palestinian writers here because they don't even want to be here. So. Okay. Okay, I, I take that into account. I, I thought I said that in a way, but I didn't enough. So, but I hope you understand the whole project of it. And please tell me more tomorrow when there's more time and stay with us. That's the only thing I can say. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nadia. Before we go, do you still dare to, <laughs> because he's sitting there and, and listening and half in shock. Now you can spell spell. He's saying, I cannot play anymore. You can for sure play. To you. A last word from Renit and Christine. Is there something you would like to say at the end of this evening, Renit? Can you take the... No, because we have to leave in 10 minutes the, the room. Sorry. You want Christine to go first? <clears throat> Thank you, Nadia. And I, am, I understand you, of course. I just said to the... No, Nadia, I just said to the gentleman there is no time for questions anymore. Yeah, Christine? Christine, will you know what to no? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. We have to leave by 10.15, so that's why we have to end. 
Come back on Friday because tomorrow Nadia and all her other colleagues are going to discuss and debate the whole day with each other. And the outcome of that, we will tell you about that on Friday. Jullie durven nog te spelen, Mohammed. For sure you do. Amsterdam Andalusian Orkest. May we Voordat we gaan starten, uh, heb ik een, een gedicht wat ik uh, graag in het Nederlands wil vertalen. Maar dat doen wij ook wel om zeg maar, de liederen die wij zingen ook natuurlijk over te kunnen brengen aan het publiek. En nou, het gaat om het volgende gedicht. Zing je mooiste liederen, de avondzon wordt er mooier van. Elk van ons... Beleefd met het glas in de hand een mooie tijd. Mijn hart verlangt naar de schoonheid die zich in mijn armen zal bevinden. Al zijn we van elkaar verwijderd, de muziek brengt ons dicht bij elkaar. Ik verlang naar mijn geliefde die mij zo dierbaar is. Dank jullie wel. الشمس العاشية أمهلة تغيب له رفقا هيا اشتب مابيا حتى زدتني في القلب شوقا ترفق علي إني في المال قد زدت عشقا في الواد المذهب في الواد المذهب في الواد المذهب في الواد المذهب ووجه المالح مثل تريا وصاق المؤدى يسقي بالاواني البندقيه صافي فلق نغنمو هاد العالم 
العشية صفي في القطعة وزيدوا ناموا هاد العشية كلنا كأس فيا يرتنم ساعة هانية كأس فيا يرتنم ساعة هانية الشرح بين يدي الملح قلبي يريد شرح بين يدي عيدا تصنع تواشي قربوا حبي إلي واعطفوا عطف الحواشي قربوا حبي إلي واعطفوا عطف الحواشي أنا كل ملك ولكم سادتي أنتم من أنا عبدا سرايتموني راخصا بلا تمن طالي طالي يا لالا يا لالا آه يا لالا هننا 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 Amsterdam's Andalusisch Orkest. Dank jullie wel, jongens. U bent welkom voor een drankje. En we hopen u vrijdag te zien.